Welcome all of you to this live program at Authentic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Professor Max Hettinger from Hanover, Germany. Professor Hettinger is from the Hanover Medical School in Hanover, Germany, and he's currently the senior consultant and head of the knee endoprosthetic division, and also the head of the computer assisted surgery and tumor orthopedics at the Diakovary Anna Stift in Hanover, Germany. Dr. Ettinger has published widely and has more than 121 publications to his credit. He's a reviewer for several journals and has been on the editorial board of the Knee Journal as an associate med editor for the orthoplasty section. If you notice, Dr. Ettinger has delivered a lecture on a channel and it's already reached a huge audience. And today is my great honor to bring back Professor Max Ettinger for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Max. Yeah, Goplan, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um... Yeah, good day to everyone uh, out there. As you see here, this is not Hannover. So I just quit my job in Hannover and I will start working at this beautiful city called Oldenburg in January. So I have quite some time to talk about phenotyping total knee arthroplasty today. Our last webinar was about alignment philosophies and um, that's about two and a half or three years ago. Um, and a lot of things changed uh, in, in between those times. And um, this is what's gonna be this is what I'm going to talk about today. So what is our main problem today with our knee arthroplasty patients? It's not that our implants don't last long or we have like super high early revision rates. It's that patients are not entirely happy with their total knee because they feel uncomfortable like this pony. Patients have the feeling that the knee doesn't belong to them and they have what we call a non-forgotten joint. What's the deal about that? It's because we don't take joint line height and joint line obliquity into account. And with our um, approaches, we, um, we go for total knee arthroplasty. Uh, we most of the times alter the joint line height and joint line obliquity. So this is a good example. If you look at this knee, um, preoperatively and postoperatively, everyone would say this is a perfect result. But this knee looks good and feels bad. On the other hand, if you look at this knee, um, same type of virus knee, and um, the postoperative result looks like this. Uh, this knee looks good and feels good. And um, both of them were done robotically. And it's uh, basically what we are going to talk about today. Where is the difference between those two knees? And why do both of them look good, but only one feels good? So when you think about the the natural alignment, and that is something we talk about a lot lately, um, we have to be aware of what is the natural alignment of the knee. And this is uh, a good example. If you look at the, um, at, the, at the first case, you will see that the LDFA is 86 and the MPTA is 84. And you can calculate basically the pre natural situation of the knee just if you have those two parameters. So if you look at the LDFA and MPTA, you will see that this knee has a natural alignment prior to the osteotritis of three degree varus. So it's a mistake to basically bring a knee from three degree varus preoperative natural alignment to zero. And um, this calculation is really easy. And this is um, what the phenotype calculation is based on. If you look into the publication from Sam McDessey from Australia together with Prof Bellemans from Belgium, you will see that we talk about nine boxes today. That's what you see here on the left side. Um, one column is varus, one column is neutral, and one column is valgus. And in order to have nine boxes, we need three more rows. And for the first row is apex distal, and that's what we see here. So joint line looking like this. Second column is joint line neutral and the third row is um, apex proximal, so joint line vice versa. And in order to see in what box your patient is in, you have to do the math as I did um, before. So you always have to be aware, what is your LDFA and what is your MPTA? So we can conclude that varus is not varus. We have to think about um, the natural joint line um, obliquity as well. Really important is that this phenotyping is aiming for the, the status of the limb 
prior to the osteoarthritis. And we know from a, from a recent study that LDFA and MPTA don't change that much uh, during the process of osteoarthritis. So osteoarthritis degree one or four um, most of the times have the same degree of um, of those two angles. So it's a pretty much super precise way of calculating that. And this is how we can put our patients into the box. Let me give you some examples. You see here a phenotype one. We have an LDFA of 86. Uh, we have an MPTA of 84. So in calculation, we have a three degree virus overall limp alignment naturally. And the LDFA of 86 indicates that we have an apex distal. Another example, and really important to know, um, and this is why I said virus is not virus, we have an LDFA of 85, we have an MPTA of 85, so 5 minus 5 is 0. So the natural alignment of this virus knee is neutral, right? So um, this patient is a type 2 because the alignment of the limb was straight prior to osteoarthritis. And of course, if the LDFA is um, 85, we have an apex distal. So this one here belongs to group two. Um, group three, for example, LDFA 82, MPTA 87. We know that we have um, a natural um, overall alignment, which is valgus. And as the LDFA is 82, we have an apex distal here as well. Let's have a look at a, at a type four. You see here that we have an LDFA of 89, an MPTA of, um, of 85. Um, so we know that we have a natural alignment that is varus, but we have a neutral joint line here on the femoral side. And this is why this is a type four, okay? So we don't see an apex distal. We saw we see a horizontal joint line and so on and so on. And this, for example, is a type six. Um, uh, we see that we have an LDFA of nine and an MPTA of two. So we know that um, even though the axis of the limb um, looks more or less neutral, uh, this is a type four with an apex distal. And when you wanna, um, orientate yourself um, uh, at those phenotypes prior to the operation, you really have to make up your mind, what kind of virus am I dealing with or what kind of virus am I dealing with? And sometimes uh, knees that look virus to you like this type two are naturally neutral. Okay, what we do systematically now is we transfer every single knee um, into phenotype box five, which is neutral alignment, horizontal joint line, and this is what we call mechanical alignment, right? So we transfer all of our boxes systematically into the middle. And that is a mistake, except for the knees that are phenotype four, uh, five preoperatively anyways. So what we do is we do three common mistakes. We don't reconstruct the natural axis of the limb. So we had three degree valgus, six degree varus, as I said before, three degree virus would be the natural overall limp alignment. We brought it into neutral, okay? First mistake. Second mistake, we don't reconstruct the natural joint line. Once again, LDFA 86, LDFA 90. No reconstruction of the natural joint line, obliquity. And now the third problem is we distalize on the lateral side and go up with the joint line on the medial side if we transfer everybody into group five. And this means that we ignore joint line, um, the joint line height as well, especially on the medial side that has biomechanical consequences we're gonna talk about later. So what we systematically do is we have our um, joint line height, joint line obliquity, and our ligament capsule um, apparatus that is uh, basically adapted to uh, the natural situation. And we transfer uh, everything into neutral and then we create an imbalance. Okay, what is the concept of phenotyping? Of course, we have to make up our mind what kind of anatomy am I dealing with? Um, what kind of um, soft tissue properties am I dealing with? And then we have to precisely be able to transfer our plane um, and uh, keep, the, keep the knee in that phenotype. So three things are different when we basically do a phenotyping approach. We want to reconstruct the natural axis of the knee. So look at this one, two degree valgus, five degree varus. Once again, three degree varus overall limb alignment. This is what we reconstruct. 
Um, second thing is we want to reconstruct the joint line obliquity. So you see here LDFA 88, LDFA 88. So reconstruction of the obliquity. And then really important, we don't go up with the joint line on the media side and we keep it laterally where it belongs. Really important, uh, this is not an instability. This is a special implant that is thicker medially compared to lateral and that is compensated by the poly, all right? So we have uh, a built-in joint line obliquity here. So in the end, we have the joint line height, joint line obliquity, everything is um, adapted to this situation and we put the implant according to the bony anatomy and soft tissue envelope. What is the consequence? So if you have this systematic approach where we bring everything into phenotype five compared to leaving it in its um, natural phenotype group, we see that we basically don't alter our soft tissue envelope. And especially on the media side, the MCL is really sensitive um, to stress. So we have MCL strain um, by 0 0.1 millimeter of stretching the MCL and that makes patients uh, have an uncomfortable feeling and a non-forgotten joint. So what are we aiming for when we go for a phenotype-based approach? Um, we will try not to um, alter the MPTA. We want to reconstruct the lateral femoral angle. We don't want um, any or less bony corrections to um, compared to if we go always for a five. We want a rectangular extension gap and we have a flexion gap that is um, basically asymmetric as you see here. So what's the deal with phenotyping and why is phenotyping um, so important? It's because we want to reconstruct the femoral anatomy as close as possible. We know from a lot of studies and from all of the um, alignment philosophy uh, discussion that probably the most important axis of the knee is the primary flexion and extension axis, which is the green one here. And that is defined by the shape of the condyles medially and of course, laterally as well. So what we want to do in consequence is reconstruct this green line. And this is um, uh, of course a 3D um, approach. So reconstructing this green line means um, um, in consequence, leaving the patient um, in his phenotype box. This is basically um, adapted from the kinematic alignment concept. So if we reconstruct that green primary reflection axis, extension axis of the knee, we will um, basically reconstruct the primary reflection extension axis of the patella automatically. And this is why this concept is uh, really patella friendly. And I will show you in a while um, uh, some clinical examples. All right. What is the consequence if we don't reconstruct that green line? Remember uh, the first case, what happens if we go up with the joint line, especially on the media side, we change the joint kinematics by going upwards. This is a really nice study conducted by Jan Victor from Belgium, where they checked on the effect of going upwards with the joint line on the media side. Um, and the effect is that we changed the center of rotation of the knee. The problem is that the that the insertion point of the MCL stays uh, where it naturally belongs. And you can see this mismatch here. So the orange dot is the MCL, the blue dot is the joint line proximalization with the new center of the rotation of the knee. And in extension, that is compensated by a higher poly. This is why um, they put in a poly 13, as you see here. What happens then when we go in 45 degree of flexion with the knee is that the center of rotation, the new center of rotation goes proximal and um, the MCL uh, goes uh, distal. And this is how we create mid flex instability. Okay, so going upwards means mid flex instability. And this is basically the biomechanical explanation for it. And this is why it's so important to keep the joint line uh, where it has to belong. The drawback of this is that when we go to 90 degree, um, the center of rotation goes downwards and the MCL goes upwards. So patients with the joint line proximalization have pain in extension, they are loose in mid flexion and they don't flex good. So it's basically um, a triathlon of disasters. 
And as you see here, four millimeter are enough in order to um, make the patient feel it all the time. Of course, a knee like this will last 15 years as well, but those are exactly the patients that say, okay, I suffer when I go upwards and downwards of the stairs, I cannot play golf and I have a little pain all the time. So as I said before, we have to reconstruct the femoral anatomy. And of course the femur, uh, the shape of the femur is very individual. Um, and this is once again, the primary flexion extension of the knee. And if we wanna reconstruct that, we have to reconstruct the so-called distal condylar offset and the posterior femoral offset in the transversal plane as well, right? This is uh, what we wanna reconstruct. This is the reason why knees that are kinematically aligned, for example, always look a bit um, twisted because we wanna reconstruct um, basically the, the shape of the bone one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you saw a lot of pictures of different uh, x-rays here already. Um, this is uh, the knee I use um, um, yeah, most of the times because I have a built-in offset here distally already. This is what I said. The, the prosthesis is thicker medially and uh, thinner laterally on the femoral side, and that is compensated by the onlay. But what I can do easily, if I have an offset, some knees don't have one, then you have to use a symmetric prosthesis. You can reconstruct basically this offset one-on-one, um, -on -one, and this is why those um, X-rays look um, different if you are not used to uh, a specific implant like this one. Um, I use a robot in all of my cases. So what I do is I really make up my mind what kind of um, phenotype am I dealing with because I want to keep my knees in the box. So you see two examples here. And in those cases where I have um, an offset uh, distally, I of course use a prosthesis that has an offset within the prosthesis. But sometimes, and this is the, the neutral column right here, the knee um, is neutral on the distal femur. And then of course um, I use a symmetric prosthesis because it makes it way easier to reconstruct the distal part of the femur. And this, this is why a knee like this is reconstructed uh, with a prosthesis like that. And a knee like this, where we have basically a neutral part, distal part of the femur is reconstructed with a neutral prosthesis. So um, in, in the future, we will have to talk about different prosthesis options as well when we wanna go for different alignment philosophies. When you look at the distribution um, of, um, of the phenotypes, you will see that um, in Central Europe, so this is from a, from a Caucasian population, this is different in India or in China. Uh, I will talk about this in a while. You will see that uh, most of the patients have an apex distal joint line. So basically um, some sort of an LDFA, which is 88, 87, 86, or 85. Some of them are neutral and around 15% have a neutral joint line. So in 15% of the cases, uh, symmetric prosthesis um, makes sense to use. If you go into Asia or, uh, or Indian uh, populations, you will see that most of the cases uh, up to 90 or 95% have an apex distal and neutral joint lines are very uncommon. Uh, the far more east you go, um, from my uh, point of view where I live. So um, it is really important that you make up your mind where you live. So in consequence, 85% of the cases in Central Europe um, have an oblique joint line, as you see here. Um, and those are the cases uh, in the upper left-hand corner. All right. Um, what are we doing if we have um, um, cases that are... Um, totally off the shelf, as you saw before. Um, normally we don't have um, phenotype nine because it's really, really rare. So this is a phenotype nine I did a, a while ago. So LDFA 86, MPTA 95. So apex going upwards, um, joint line um, obliquity um, uh, basically twisted around. Um, and those are the cases where I go for uh, um, uh, custom-made prosthesis. This is the plan for the custom-made prosthesis. You see here that those cases often um, have a really uh, big problem anteriorly. So the posterior condylar axis um, is in no relationship with the anterior trochlear line, as you see here. Uh, and in those cases, I use uh, um, 
a custom-made prosthesis where um, the manufacturer builds me an individual trochlea. So uh, it is not only that for phenotyping out of the bell curve, um, um, we need solutions like this um, if we really want to make it good. So that works as well. As you see here, we have uh, we kept the, the, the phenotype um, postoperatively. I want to focus um, a little bit more on the patella, why it's so important to really keep an eye on reconstructing the distal part of the femur. So what's the difference between a mechanical alignment approach, so bringing everybody into phenotype 5, compared to reconstructing the distal part of the femur? And this basically explains everything. So imagine a right knee in 45 degree of flexion with an LDFA of 85, so 80, so five degree of valgus in the distal part of the femur. And if you reconstruct that, and that's the red line here with, with your prosthesis, um, you will keep um, the, uh, the balance between lateral and medial structures uh, and the patella will track fine. If you go distal, on the lateral condyle, as you see here, so overstuff the lateral compartment, you will increase the strength of the lateral retinaculum. And if you go up with the joint line medially, you will decrease the strength of the medial structures. And this is um, when the patella is not tracking good. And this is when people have anterior knee pain, uh, when they are sitting with their knee in 45, 60, 70 degree of flexion. So it is really important, especially for anterior knee pain to reconstruct the distal part of the femurs. Good, what's the deal on the valgus side? Um, we know that uh, we have two types of valgus um, uh, patients. Uh, some of them are stiff, but some of them um, have a, what we call multi-joint disease. So we have problems on the hip, we have problems of the knee, especially MCL overstretch, PCL overstretch, but um, the foot and the ankle um, is a problem as well. And those cases um, are probably the toughest ones, especially when they come from phenotype 3, because the knee is not able to stabilize uh, itself. So we have to help the poor knee, and the knee is the slave of the hip and the ankle, as I always say. Uh, so we have to take care of the stability here as well. So it is really important that we don't reconstruct the bony anatomy one-on-one -on -one without thinking about uh, the soft tissue properties of the knee. Let me give you an example how it shouldn't work, um, even though if you want to do phenotyping. So imagine, once again, uh, phenotype 3, apex distal, natural alignment is valgus. And if you reconstruct that one-on-one, -on -one, and if you want to keep that knee um, in that box, the only thing you have to do theoretically is reconstruct the bony anatomy one-on-one, -on -one, but by doing that, you of course reconstruct the instability as well. And we always have to keep in mind that the soft tissue pre plays um, a very important role as well. So you see here that this knee is opening up on the medial side. And of course, this is not gonna function because the instability comes from the hip as well. So if you see a hip where we had a big revision Preoperatively, uh, preoperatively to our knee, we have to think about uh, the problem might be um, one stage uh, more proximal. So we cannot just go ahead and reconstruct the bony anatomy here one on one. And um, I will show you how it uh, might work differently. So another case, 85, 95. So we know we have 10 degree um, natural HKA. Uh, this is a sagittal plane. We know here. Once again, patella problem, a lot of osteophytes in the back. And this is the result. Once again, with the asymmetric prosthesis. So you see that we did an undercorrection of the limb by two, milli by two degree. And have a close look at the distal part of the femur. We reconstructed the joint line height and joint line obliquity one-on-one. -on -one, and it is really similar to the preoperative situation, even though we corrected the limb and we corrected um, the the instability to a degree um, which is feasible. We know that uh, when we use robotics in those cases that we are really super precise in reconstructing offset and all of these things. And those cases are really um, nice to reconstruct if you use navigation or uh, robotics and you are able to really keep them um, in the phenotype box. 
Let's just have a look at implant planning. This is uh, from one of the robots that are using, and this is the case I was just showing. If you look at the distal part of the femur, I highlighted it um, yellow here. You see that in, in, in the implant planning, gray is that is the metal of the implant. And you see here that even though we have a severe vagus of the distal part of the femur, we can basically shape match the distal part of the femur by just rotating the knee one degree into vagus. And now you have to pay attention to the upper, to the, to the right-hand side um, downwards. So we bring the limb to one degree vagus. So we keep it in that box, but we are able to reconstruct the joint line height and joint line obliquity one-on-one. -on -one. And that is basically um, what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Really important, even though we have approaches like that today, uh, we have to know and we have to teach our residents um, how to balance because sometimes um, you cannot bring the limb back into a biomechanical um, reasonable um, overall limb alignment. And of course, um, this phenotyping approach has boundaries. Um, and uh, on the virus side, my maximum overall limb alignment is six and on the vagus side, it's two. So once again, um, this knee came from, um, from a phenotype three box and by under correcting the limb a little bit and reconstructing the distal part of the femur with this asymmetric prosthesis, we were able to keep it in box three. So phenotyping in the end means keep the patient um, uh, in the box where it came from. Yeah, and if you do that, you basically have your joint line height and obliquity, your soft tissue envelope, and you basically just put in the implant according to the bony anatomy and soft tissue envelope. Just some scientific data before I uh, come to an end with my presentation. Um, if you look at those knees here, so you see here it was robotic as well. Valgus type 3 reconstructed with a symmetric prosthesis in a mechanical alignment approach. So transferring the 3 um, into the 5 on the Valgus side, um, and I compared those to same classification, box 3. Keeping them in box three um, has a big difference um, on the outcome. So if you look at the forgotten joint score um, of those two patient groups, you will see that there's a huge difference um, um, between these two groups. So 59 uh, versus 46 of robotic uh, knees that were kept in, in the box on um, here for those Vargas cases compared to transferring them um, basically to uh, to phenotype 5 into the middle. Interestingly, there's not a big difference uh, in Oxford knee score and um, knee society score because they, these scores cannot differentiate um, and basically uh, display the satisfaction um, as the forgotten joint score uh, is able to do that. If we have a look at the virus side, um, we made a comparison about those as well. So especially... Um, virus type uh, one. So overall limb alignment virus and apex distal, we compared them as you see here. This is with the symmetric prosthesis. Once again, you saw this knee earlier, 85, 85, um, and then um, compare them to uh, a pure mechanical alignment approach where those uh, knees were transferred into uh, box five. We saw big differences here as well. So the forgotten joint score, mechanical versus kinematic alignment um, in CPEC-1 significantly different. And, and this is basically um, uh, no surprise, in CPEC-2, um, the difference between KA and MA is not as huge because CPEC-1, uh, CPEC-2 is uh, basically um, in a natural um, limp alignment um, anyways. All right, so in conclusion, um, it comes more clearly that we should um, keep our patients uh, in, in the phenotype boxes. Um, and if you do that, you will definitely decrease your um, uncomfortable patients. And I think that this is something um, we have to further look into, uh, of course, with uh, RCTs and stuff as well. So this is my, my new hospital from January on. If you have any questions or any, um, any wishes or wanna learn more about it, uh, just write me an email. And now I will just hand over back to Goplan, please.
thank you, Max, uh, for this brilliant presentation. And uh, congratulations for the new hospital as well. Thanks. Uh, Max, you have a few questions. Max, we are looking at a scenario where we want to have the native alignment of the knee, right? Correct. So now we have uh, two situations. For example, one just prior to surgery, that is a pre pre-surgical, and one is even before the arthritis sets in, for example, pre-arthritic. Yeah. And in an ideal situation, we should restore it to the pre-arthritic knee, right? Rather than the pre -surgical. Exactly. So exactly. are you looking at that particular point? Because to get into that, you need to have a normal opposite side knee, isn't it? No, uh, this is what I try to say. So the whole CPEC classification uh, is based on the calculation of the LDFA and MPTA. And it is really interesting because even if you have osteoarthritis, the LDFA and the MPTA don't change that much within the process of osteoarthritis. So if you do the math, as I showed, you can basically calculate the pre situation precisely by one and a half to two degree. Because within the development of osteoarthritis, MPTA and LFA don't change that much. And if they change, they change simultaneously so that the math uh, basically comes out um, back to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the natural alignment um, automatically. And this is the interesting thing about this approach. So of course it is easier if you have, uh, let's say um, uh, an easy uh, medial bone on bone osteoarthritis, there it is precise by one and a, or by, by, by a half degree. If you have end stage osteoarthritis, um, um, uh, degree four, it is still um, it is still precise because what I do in my daily practice is I do a hybrid technique between um, measured resection and gap balancing. So what I see is I calculate my natural alignment as I as I showed preoperatively, and I put in the numbers into the robot. So I bring the natural valgus and the and the calculated natural varus um, into the robot, and the machine shows me the simulated balance afterwards, right? And that fits by one and a half to two um, degrees. So I only have to do adjustments by one or uh, two degrees. So this is basically what proves um, the, the concept. So within the whole discussion of where do we want to go, we have to make up our minds, where does the patient come from? And what is my personal boundary? Because you can really calculate, okay, I'm going to probably end up with a degree of virus if I do a no release approach. Okay, then we know, okay, it's probably biomechanically not the best idea. So we have to do releases. Um, but if you do the math, uh, you can, you, you always know where to go. And really important is that by doing that, you have to put the patient in one of those boxes. And that's, that's basically the key message of this talk because it's probably not um, so critical if uh, let's say um where where in box one you keep the patient okay so let's say the patient has a natural alignment of let's five degree so it's probably benefit not not that big of a game changer if you bring him back to two and a half or if you leave him in five but the most important thing is that you keep him in the box postoperatively so if you have an oblique joint line and you have a virus aim for a virus under correction and try to reconstruct the joint line obliquity. That's basically the key message, you know, and this approach um, basically makes you as a surgeon deal more with your goal where you want to go to. Thank you, Max. Uh, Max, but this particular problem you're talking about is in this plane, right? The coronal plane. Yeah. And what about the flexion extension, the trans cylindrical axis that we mentioned, I mean, that we discussed, do you think there's a difference significantly between the pre-arthritic and the pre-surgical knee? Um, yeah, that might be true. The problem is that um, if we don't um, do CT or MRI, we are not able to pre-operatively even have a clue about the transversal plane. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, um, I think 
within the Nice society, it's clear that we want to reconstruct the media side one on one because we don't want to go upwards on the uh, with the joint line. But then we have still the discussion: what is beneficial for the artificial situation in terms of our flexion gap? I mean, we want a we want a rectangular extension gap like this, okay? But in flexion, what are we aiming for? Do we want a rectangular? Do we want some lift off on the lateral side? We don't know, and I think it's a big difference if you have a CR prosthesis or PS or whatever, you have to know your implant. So we have to do compromises on the lateral side and the transversal plane all the time because we still have a, a standard prosthesis in most, of the, in most of the cases, and we have to find the best compromise between reconstructing posteriorly on the lateral side and anteriorly in order to reconstruct the trochlea, okay? So that is something that is still um, up to a debate. And um, uh, I think in the frontal plane, um, uh, the situation is, is clear now at the moment, but in the transversal plane, uh, there's a lot of research that we have to do because this classification is CPAC and C means coronal plane, okay? But we, we are talking about a three-dimensional concept. But I think the, the good thing about um, talking about those phenotypes is that now we have a baseline where we can do our research from and everybody has the same baseline to talk about, you know? Because um, a couple of years ago, when we didn't have those classifications, um, we, we discussed, okay, what are you doing? Kinematic alignment or mechanical or anatomic? And now we have to say, okay, in which group are we doing what? So in group one, I do restricted KA. In group two, I do full KA. In group three, I do anatomic. You know what I mean? So it is really important that we um, basically distinguish from where do we come from. So we have to define a baseline. And I think that those phenotypes um, give us a nice baseline to discuss from um, further on uh, when we talk about alignment. Thank you, Max. And Max, uh, people are still talking about kinematic alignment. So yeah, what, yeah. Where, do you, where do you place the phenotypic alignment? Do you think it's a more specified form of uh, kinematic alignment or it's slightly different? Um, it is slightly different uh, because we have to we have to make a difference what does kinematic alignment mean in which phenotype so in phenotype 1 with kinematic alignment we one on one reconstruct the natural preatritic alignment of the knee and we reconstruct the joint line height and joint line obliquity one on one i think that's totally fine that's what i do same in phenotype 2 where we have a natural limb alignment that is neutral but we still have a joint line obliquity. But then we come to phenotype three, where our natural alignment is valgus, and we have a we have an apex distal valgus joint line um, obliquity as well. And now we have to think about the, the two different scenarios. If you reconstruct a phenotype three one on one bony, you reconstruct the instability as well this is the x-ray i was just showing so this is why it's so important um, and i do ka in phenotype one and two but i do anatomic alignment in phenotype three where i make the limb just like one degree valgus uh, but try to reconstruct the joint line height and obliquity with a special implant for example so it is really important that um, people learn that Let's say kinematic alignment means something totally different if we do it in a phenotype one or a phenotype six. And I think that this is this is what we have to talk about in the future. So in the future, we have to talk about what do you do in a phenotype one or what do you do in a phenotype six? So um, that's that's a big difference and that's really important. Thank you, Max. I think that's uh, great that uh, whenever you see a knee, you need to put into those nine boxes, right? Any Any joint replacement surgeon, before he starts to do the joint replacement, he should try to put it in any of these nine boxes, isn't it? Exactly, because if you do that, you have you 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 will you will go deeper into the case, and then you know, okay, here I want to reconstruct 
let's say a varus or here no here i want to go straight or here i want to go a little valgus and 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 this really helps uh, in order to to make up your mind um what you're dealing with and max uh, so to go into these boxes i mean it's critical that we need to do it in navigation right in a conventional instrument it is going to be very difficult isn't it <laughs> Honestly, as I'm a computer, I'm a computer guy. I think yes, um, because I don't think that it is possible. So let's say in a this is exactly one, what I wanted to say. So in a in a in a phenotype one or two, you can probably do it conventional somehow. If you wanna keep a phenotype three in the box, it is really it that is really tough because people don't want to have a, a, a huge valgus. So um, it is hard to aim for two degree of valgus and build in a little um, obliquity of the joint line. So I think once again, it's a difference. What phenotype am I addressing? But I would say that we have easier phenotypes to treat conventional compared to other ones. Thank you, Max. Uh, Max, that thing, that's all the questions we have for this session. Thank you for this very enlightening talk. And I'm sure this is going to benefit a lot of people. Thank you so much for joining us.